focus on, John 15, if you'll turn there with me this evening, John 15, and we'll read verses 1 through 8. Good to see you here this evening. Praise the Lord. Good crowd tonight. Amen. God is blessing, isn't he? Amen. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to see that. Amen. We prayed a long time, went a long time without a pastor, and waited on the Lord. I believe he's honored that. Amen. And given us a great pastor, and I we have great, great days ahead for uh, Amazing Grace Baptist Church. Amen and amen. I've heard pastors say many times God's given him a vision. Amen. And uh, I think I preached here where there is no vision, the people perish. Amen. And uh, a, a church with no vision, a, play, a church that's not going anywhere, is a stagnant, dead church. Amen. And so praise the Lord. I'm glad we got a pastor that's got some drive. Amen. Amen. Preachers need to have drive. And preachers don't need to know how to drive a golf ball. Amen. <laughs> it's okay if they can, but that's not what they need. They need to drive for the Lord. Amen. And uh, they don't need to know how to, how to, uh, how to play uh, tennis and all that kind of stuff. If they do, that's okay. But they need to know how to do something for God. And I believe we got a good man of God. Amen. Hope you're praying for him every day. Hope you're encouraging him. Write him a note once in a while. Amen. Just write him a little note. Say, preacher, I appreciate you. If, you, if, you, if the message speaks to your heart, write him a note about it. Amen. Because it's, uh, <clears throat> it encourages a preacher. You keep your preacher encouraged, he'll keep you encouraged. You keep your preacher discouraged, he'll have a hard time keeping you encouraged. Amen. And so do that. Amen. Well, uh, John chapter 15. This evening I want to speak on the subject, a fruitful Christian. A fruitful Christian. James, uh, John 15, verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Here we see the word fruit, 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 which was to bring forth much fruit. And here's my Father glorified in verse 8, that you bear much fruit. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, would you help me tonight? I need the power of the Holy Ghost. Speak to hearts, Father. Speak to my heart. We really need to be changed, Lord. Truth of the matter is, I don't believe there's one of us here tonight. It's everything we ought to be. I don't believe any of us here tonight can say that we're the fruitful Christian we ought to be. I don't believe any of us can say that we don't need anything tonight. I believe if we be honest, we all need something great tonight. I need something. Father, I'm a, I'm a big failure. I never am what I ought to be. I'm glad you're merciful and gracious, but I'm glad also, Lord, that you want me to strive for the mastery. You don't want me to be satisfied. You want me to work hard. You want me to put my effort into it. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, doeth I might. Paul said he pressed and he reached towards the mark. He didn't just walk towards it. He didn't just stroll towards it. He pursued it and he pushed himself. And Father, there's certainly no doubt that Christianity today needs to push itself to do more for the cause of Christ. The world is dying and going to hell. America's turning into a wicked place. And if anything's going to change, it's going to change because we Christians decide to stand up and really get on fire and do something great for the cause of Christ while we still have time. Stir us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. It is God's will, and he has designed it, that you and I who are saved should bring forth fruit. Here Jesus said, I'm the true vine, and my Father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. That's a pretty frightening statement. <clears throat> Does Jesus just make statements that are not true? Does Jesus just say things off the cuff like Donald Trump's been doing? Amen. And, uh, you know, does he just do that? No, he doesn't. He says, now look, I'm the vine and you're the branches. <clears throat> What's he talking about? <clears throat> well, I would say he's probably talking about a grapevine, wouldn't you? But obviously, whatever he's talking about, it is some kind, of a, it's some kind of a vine that has a branch going off of it, and what it does is it produces fruit, just like a grapevine would do. 
And Jesus said, now you are the branch, and if you don't bear fruit, the Father will take you away. And he says, in every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it bring forth more fruit. God wants you and I and has designed us to bring forth fruit. We are to be fruit bearers. Amen. We are to bring forth fruit. Now, you've got to think with me just a moment. Well, a grapevine produces grapes. Amen. And inside that grape is a seed. And that seed is the most important part of the plant. How do we know that? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 8, God said, let, let every herb of the ground bearing seed bring forth. And God made it very clear that what was important in his creation was the seed. How do you know that? Because he said so that it could continue to refurbish itself. He said to every animal, he said, now I made you so that you bring forth and replenish when he created man and woman, he gave them the opportunity to bear children. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. And God, when he created everything, everything that produces, he created it not just for the fruit, but for the fact that it had a life-producing thing inside the seed. Did you know that it is not the soil that has the life, it's the seed that has the life? So if you go out here and you just put, you just go out here and you just, you just, uh, you, you rotate till up your garden, roll up to your soil, and don't plant anything there. And say, all right, come on, t- carrots grow. Come on, potatoes grow. Come on, tomatoes grow. No, in order for those to grow, you have to go out there and put something very important in the ground. You have to put a thing called a seed in the ground. And the Bible is teaching here, Jesus is not saying here to you and I that you and I don't need to be something, something pleasant for people to look at. Though that's okay, that's a part of it. Pleasant for somebody to taste, though that's okay, that's a part of it. When Jesus is saying here that we need to produce fruit, he is talking about reproduction. He's talking about reproducing ourselves. Say, really, Houston, I'm not sure if I believe that. Well, go to Proverbs chapter 11 with me, if you would, please. Proverbs chapter 11. When Jesus is saying here that I want you to bring forth fruit, when God says I want you to be a fruitful Christian, he's saying I want you to produce other Christians. Amen. And if you don't produce other Christians, you're of no real value to me. Amen. He said you really are not fulfilling your purpose. It's like this, you know, every man in here that marries a wife, he wants her to produce children for him. Now, some can't, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, that's not a sinful thing. But but that's what what he created us for. That's what he created woman for. That's what he created marriage for, that we might replenish the earth and multiply. And the reason that he saved you and I was so that we could multiply. Amen. Look at Proverbs 11 and verse 30. This is my life's verse. Look what it says. The what? Fruit of the righteous. Who is the righteous? The saved are the righteous. Are any of us in here righteous in our own? No. We are righteous in Christ. We are called the righteous. So the fruit of the righteous is what? A tree of life. You know what the fruit of the righteous is? The the, the righteous is like a tree, and that tree brings forth life. In other words, the fruit, the apple on the apple tree. When that apple falls to the ground and is not eaten, that seed there produces another living tree. When that tomato a seed falls to the ground, it produces another living tomato plant. Amen? And that's what God is saying. He's saying the fruit of a righteous person, the fruit of a Christian, is a tree of life. How do you know that? Because look at the second part. And he that what? When a souls is wise. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I want you to be a soul winner. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to produce other Christians. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Amen. Lo, children are the heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. What is the fruit of the womb? It's a baby. What God wants you and I to do is be producing babies, Christian babies. Amen. Not in the physical way, the spiritual way. You and I were saved to bring forth children. I I don't don't know if I I, I believe that, Brother Houston. Go to Romans chapter 7 with me. Romans chapter 7. You see, the Bible says there are some things that are never satisfied. The barren womb. The barren womb. That womb that can never bear. You remember Rachel. She couldn't have any children. You remember that she went to Jacob and she said, Give me children lest I die. 
And that ought to be the cry of every Christian. God, give me somebody to win to you lest I die. If you've never led anybody to Christ, it ought to be breaking your heart. It ought to be causing you to shed tears on an altar. God, I'm saved on my way to heaven. I know how to tell people to go to heaven, but I have never birthed anybody into your family. I've never brought forth another Christian into birth. That's what a fruitful Christian is. Now, that's not the fruit of the Spirit. That's a totally different thing. We think because I have the fruit of the Spirit that God's pleased with me. And the fruit of the Spirit is something the Spirit does in our life. And we should have that. But God says, I want you to bring forth fruit. And I want you to just bring forth fruit. I'd like for you to bring forth more fruit. I'd like for you to bring forth much fruit. And if you'll bring forth much fruit, my Father will be glorified in that. You know what brings glory to God? When people get saved. When people get saved, people say, glory to God, hallelujah. Hey, God is real, and God and he gets the glory when people get saved, amen. And we should be in the soul-saving business. Well, not saving, winning, amen. He that wins his souls is why God saves them, amen. But that's what he's talking about. Well, so look at Romans chapter 7, look at it. Romans chapter 7 and verse 1. Let's look at the taught context. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law have dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the, the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she may be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, he's talking here about marriage. Marriage is something that God ordained to be for life. Amen? And when the husband dies, the wife is no longer under that law. She's free to remarry. If the wife dies, the husband's no longer under that commitment. He's free to remarry. Now, he puts it in the context of marriage, okay? Anytime you look at a verse, you've got to take it in its context. So he's talking about marriage. Now, watch verse number 4. Don't miss it. Wherefore, my brethren, if you're a saved, you're a brethren, right? Amen. Or a sister, amen. I mean a sister, amen. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Watch the next statement that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. You see, the Old Testament was a covenant with Abraham, a covenant, and the New Testament is a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. In the Old Testament, God had a covenant marriage with Israel. Israel was God's spiritual wife. God divorced his spiritual wife because of their sin. He's coming back to get them back out of the slave market and remarry them, amen, make them his wife for all eternity. But in the New Testament, when you and I got saved, we became the bride of Christ. And the Bible says here, spiritually, when you and I were, were with the covenant of the law, the law could never save us. He said, now we are, we, are, we, are, we are in a new covenant, a new relationship, and that relationship is a marriage to Christ. Not physical, spiritual. Amen? Now watch it. That, that ye should be married to another, even to him who raised him from the dead, Watch the next statement, that we, those of us who have been married to Christ, those of us who are saved, that we should bring forth, what? Fruit unto God. As the wife brings forth fruit for her husband, as the wife reproduces a living human being, all of us that are saved are supposed to bring forth a, a living, born-again Christian to Christ. Amen. Do you see it? A fruitful Christian. Are you a fruitful Christian tonight? Do you have any spiritual children? Have you led anybody to Christ? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to challenge you. Understand that that's what God is looking for. That's what God, he says in his word, released us from that old covenant so we could be married to Jesus Christ who raised from the ground, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. As a woman brings forth fruit unto her husband, God saved me so that I could reproduce. 
He saved me so that I could take what I know about going to heaven and share it with other people so they can have the same salvation I have so that they can get from deadness to life in Christ Jesus. Amen? We were dead in trespasses and sin, but when you get born again to Christ, you get born again, you have new life in Christ, you become alive, and God's saying, I, I want you to birth again, birth some people into my family. Listen, that's what's missing of our churches. We're not seeing people saved. We're not birthing anybody. If you're here and you're saved tonight, I love you, I love you with all my heart, but if you've never led anybody to Christ, something ought to be breaking in your heart. Something ought to be happening inside your soul saying, God, I do not want to be a barren Christian. I do not want to be fruitless. I do not want to go to heaven empty-handed. Must I go in empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to meet Him. Must I empty-handed go? I went to church nine months before I was born. Amen? And I got born, and at the age of five, I accepted Christ as Savior. And at the age of ten, I got, conv- I got, con- I got convicted, I got burdened about my friends. And I wanted to see them saved. But I didn't know how to tell them how to be saved. I just wanted to see them saved. And I just praised that God, I want to see my friends saved. And I remember walking down the lunch line, getting our food, you know, by the, the, the cooks fixed it, untouched by human hands, packaged by gorillas. Amen. You know what I'm talking about? Amen. <laughs> and I'm walking down there, and Joe Shrug's next to me. And I finally got enough courage, Brother Dotson, to say, uh, Joe, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, Joe, if you die tonight, are you sure you're going to heaven? And he said, yes. I didn't know how far, anything else to do. I knew Joe was a Mennonite boy. It probably understood what it took to be saved. It probably ought that he didn't understand that you didn't have to keep it. Amen? But I had a burden in my heart. I become a 20-some-year-old man, and I'm in Osage City, Kansas, a football coach, and Brother Maury Gibson came and preached on where Rachel where She said, give me children lest I die. And he began to say, if you're a barren Christian, you've never led anybody to Christ. You ought to have a broken heart. You ought to be on an altar saying to God, give me children lest I die. And I fell on that altar, and I wept, and I said, God, I have never led anybody to you. And God, I don't want to go to heaven being a barren Christian. God, please help me win somebody to you. And I began to pray and ask God to let me lead somebody to Christ. I I just wanted to lead one person to Christ. It's a good place to start. You don't have to start trying to lead 5,000. Or just, just, just start, get one, amen? And I just started praying and praying and praying. And I'll never forget, well, one day a, a young man came by. He was getting ready to go into the ministry already. Kind of sad. He was going into the ministry. I hadn't led anybody to Christ. That's pretty sad. God was good to me. And this young man come up, to my, come up to my driveway, and I was getting out there working in the yard, and he said, Coach, did you hear? And I said, did I hear what? He said, you hear about those two boys at Burlingame got killed in that motorcycle wreck last night? And I said, I had last night, that night, an 18-year-old driving a motorcycle with a 16-year-old in the back passed on a hill and got hit head on. They all went out, both of them went out to eternity just like that. And I said to Chris, I said, Chris, yeah, I heard about that. I said, Chris, wonder where they're at right now. And Chris said to me, what do you mean, Coach? I said, I wonder if they're in heaven or hell. He said, Coach, I never thought about that. I said, Chris, if that was you, where would you be? He said, Coach, I don't know where I'd be. I said, Chris, can I tell you what the Bible says about being sure you're going to heaven? And he let me tell him. And I got to the place. I said, Chris, do you understand what you need to do? He said, I do. I said, Chris, would you accept Christ as your Savior right now? And he said, Coach, i got to think about that. Well, you know, I didn't force him into doing it. I didn't trick him into doing it. I said, Chris, okay, I'm forced you to do it, but Chris, boy, I, please don't, don't go to hell, man. Get that settled. Well, he went off, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and we got all loaded up, and I'm sitting in the park with my family. We're getting ready to leave, and all of a sudden, this young man comes riding up on a bicycle. He gets about from me here to that uh, partition. He stops. He looks at me, come like that, and I excuse myself from my family, and I walked over. And he said, Coach, he said, get ready to leave. I said, as soon as we eat this sandwich, the truck is loaded. We're headed out of here. He said, well, I just want to tell you, I thought about what we talked about the other day. He said, last night, I got on my knees, asked Jesus, come heart my Savior, save me. You know what? I birthed my first child to God that night. <laughs> Can I tell you what joy? Have you ever birthed an infant child, I mean a physical child, into the world? Oh, the joy when you see that life born. Well, there is no, there's something better than that. There's something better than that. That's seeing a soul saved and on their way to heaven. Amen? God wants us to be fruit-bearing Christians. Here it says it is wise to win souls. Why is it wise to win souls? So you don't become extinct. Look, uh, 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 um, 
uh, the other day I was preaching and preached this sermon, and uh, there was a man and his son in that church. Neither one of them had a wife. Now, the son, of course, the one had a wife. His dad had a wife. She was dead. But the son had no wife. One son, no wife. Both of them about to die. You know what it means? Their name's going to become extinct. Because that son didn't have any children, that name's going to disappear from the earth. Can you tell you, if we do not win folks to Christ, Christianity will disappear from the earth. We will become extinct. Our brand of Christianity is becoming extinct because we got a bunch of uh, false preachers and teachers and people that, uh, that claim to be saved who are not saved. Amen. Amen. And it's because we're not out bearing fruit like we should. It's because we're not out knocking on the doors like we ought to. It's because we're not talking to people at the restaurant and as we get gas like we ought to. I said we, not us, not you. I said we. As we are not producing as many children as we should. Amen. Let me ask you this. Have you ever led anybody to Christ? If you've led somebody to Christ, when's the last time you led somebody to Christ? We're supposed to be bearing fruit. That's what we're saved for. Well, let me now tonight tell you how to be a fruitful Christian. Three ways to accomplish that. Number one, stay abiding in Christ. Look at John 15, our passage of Scripture, verse 4. Stay abiding in Christ. Look what it says in verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. What does that word abide mean? That word abide there simply means to dwell together. Amen. You see, my wife and I, we abide together. It doesn't mean that my wife and I are always talking to each other. It doesn't mean that, my, that I'm always doing something with or for my wife. It simply means that I am staying in this relationship where my wife is here and I'm with her. I know she's there. She's present with me. Jesus said, if you'll abide in me, abide in me, that you can bring forth fruit. He said, you can't do it of yourself. And I want to tell you something. I, I believe this with all my heart. If you and I will just stay in a close relationship with Jesus Christ, we will win souls. Amen. And if we're not winning souls, it means we're not staying very close to Him. The closer I get to Jesus, the more I have a passion for souls. The more my life is wrapped up in Jesus, the more I desire to have children for Him. The woman whose life is, life is wrapped up in her husband wants to have children for Him, wants to please Him, wants to do for Him. The woman whose life is wrapped up in her work doesn't really care too much. And you know, we as Christians, we're the, we're, the, we're the bride of Christ. We're his wife in a sense. And we're wrapped up in him. We will want to please him and bring souls to him. But if we're wrapped up in ourselves, and we're wrapped up in money and we're wrapped up in the world and we're wrapped up in pleasure and recreation and television and all the stuff the world has to offer, truth of the matter is we get where we don't really care if we win anybody to Christ or not. Because it's not important to me because that's not where I'm abiding. That's not where I'm living close to. I'm living close to the television set. The television set is my love. That car of mine is my love. That job I've got, I love that job. and I love that money. Can I tell you, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. God gave us richly all things to enjoy. But we're supposed to stay in an abiding relationship with Christ. And that will cause us to win souls. Amen. That's what he says. Look, abide in me, and I use the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except abide in the vine. No more can ye except you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. Watch the next statement, verse 5. He that abideth in me, and I in him, if you abide in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Go to Matthew. Keep your finger. Well, no, in John chapter 15, but go to Matthew chapter 4 with me. Go to Matthew chapter 4 with me. Abide in him. Stay abiding in Christ. Stay in love with Jesus. Don't let anything become your love more than Christ is. Stay in love with Jesus. You're my love. You're my, you're my, you're my beloved. And I am yours. Loving Christ is the greatest commandment. Not not smoking, not not drinking, loving with all your heart. That's the greatest commandment. If you stay in love with Jesus, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be out and re, you'll bear some fruit. You won't be able to help but to talk to some people about him. Hey, hey, if you're in love with, uh, with the Kansas City Royals, you talk about them. If you're in love with the Kansas City Chiefs, you talk about them. If you're in love with deer hunting, you talk about it. 
I'm not against any of that. But what do you talk about the most? What you talk about the most is where your love is the most. And what we ought to be talking about is Jesus, amen. I ought to be talking about heaven, how to be sure you're going there. When's the last time you just was so deep in love that you couldn't help but talk about him, amen? We ought to get to the place where Jesus is, a most, is the most uh, popular part of our conversation. You know, I just was in St. Louis. It's all the blues, the blues, the blues. One guy to church, came to church one night and said, how are you doing? He said, I'm happy today. The blues won. I thought, well, that's sad. Pretty sad. What makes you happy is the blues won. What makes me happy, I'm in church tonight. What makes me happy, I get to see, see what God wants to do tonight. Whether the blues won or not. I could care less whether the blues win or not. Well, you're a weirdo. I may be. I'm a nut, but I think I'm screwed on the right bolt. Amen? Matthew chapter 4. Look at Matthew chapter 4. I believe this. If you abide in Christ, you will. You will be a fruitful Christian. Look what it says in verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw his two brethren, Simon called Peter, Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, watch the next statement, follow me. Come on, start abiding with me, follow me. Get in with me, start walking with me. And they did. They started abiding with him, didn't they? Where he went, they went. Where he slept, they slept. Where he ate, they ate. Where he went to teach, they went and listened. Where he did miracles, they went along. He said, now follow me, and I will, I will, not might, make you what? I'm telling you, if you stay abiding with Christ, you'll talk to people about the Lord. If you'll just follow, if you'll just walk close to him, you get up in the morning and have that time with him, that love relationship, say, Jesus, I love you today. Thank you for saving my soul. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm so glad. And you've been so good to me. All that you've done for me, all you've given me, God, I just love you today. And you keep that love relationship going all day. I promise you'll be somewhere along the line. There'll be somebody will be burning in your heart. You have to talk to him about it. You'll at least have to pull a tract out of your pocket. Amen. And just say, yeah, I love them smiley face ones. Do we have any of those back there? Did I order smiley face when I ordered? Well, I'm going to have to order some of them, get pastor on some of them smiley face ones. I love those smiley face ones. I've never had anybody refuse a smiley face. I go to Walmart, and I get the lady to check me out. I sit here, I want to give you a smiley face today. Oh, thank you. I haven't had a smiley face. I said, that's a smiley face. It tells you how to go to heaven inside there. I've never had anybody refuse a smiley face. My wife and I were eating in a restaurant, and the waitress came over there. I put this out and said, here, I'm going to give you this smiley face. She said, hey, I've, been, I've been waitressing for 15 years, and I've never been given a smiley face. I said, well, you got one tonight, amen. That tells you how to go to heaven. That talks about Jesus. I mean, God just, Jesus says, I want you to abide with me. He said, abide with me. That's not, a, that's not an option. That's a commandment. Abide with me. Abide in me. That's a commandment. You and I, we need to get in love with Jesus. We need to get up in the morning, and we need to have a love feast before we walk out the door so we can say, all day long, I've been with Jesus. It has been a wonderful day. All day long, I've walked with him and talked with him. All day long, he and I have been in a sweet fellowship, relationship, and everything else has been secondary. I promise you, if you do that, you'll become a fruitful Christian. You'll be like Rachel. If you haven't led somebody to Christ, you'll have a broken heart. You'll be hungry to see people saved. Amen? Stay abiding. Number two, share the gospel. Go to Mark 16 and verse 15. How do I be a fruitful Christian? Share the gospel. That's not hard, is it? Very simple. Share the gospel. Share the gospel. You know, I want to see people saved. I want to be a soul winner. Oh, God, I, I, want to, I want to lead people to you. I want to have fruit. Then share the gospel. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He said, go unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature. Matthew chapter 28, he said it a different way. And he said, all power is given me. He said, lo, I'm with you all even to the end of the world. That wasn't given to those disciples. He said, look, the power's in me. They abide in me. Amen. 
And he says, now go preach the gospel, and I want you to know something. I'm going to be with you when you're doing this all the way to the end of the world. So those disciples, he didn't believe they are going to stay till the end of the world, did he? You know what he's saying? For the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation, until the world ends, I'm going to always be there with you so that you can share the gospel. How can they call on them that have not believed? How can they believe they have not heard? Over the Acts chapter 8, Philip said to the Ethiopian eunuch, understand us what they read us. He said, how can I accept some man should guide me? You didn't get saved without somebody giving the gospel. Amen. And nobody else is going to get saved without somebody getting the gospel. And you and I will never, ever, ever lead anybody to Christ by lifestyle evangelism. That's a big thing that went around. Lifestyle evangelism. Just live Christian. People get saved. Oh, really? They won't get saved unless they ask you, how's come you're different? And then you tell them you're different because you're saved. Either way, they have to hear. I'm not against lifestyle Christianity, but lifestyle will never save anybody. They cannot believe unless they hear. Share the gospel. Share the gospel. Share the gospel. It works, folks. Have you ever shared the gospel with somebody? It's an amazing thing. The power of the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Man, I have watched it as it, the light came on. Have you just ever led somebody to Christ? I mean, so you grow there. You sure you're going to heaven? No, I'm not. Let me show you from the Bible. Hey, we're all sinners. You understand you're a sinner? You know what sin is? And show us sin. I know I'm a sinner. Uh, well, the Bible says you're going to hell for your sin. Now, you're a sinner. Are you a sinner? God says all liars are going to hell. So where are you going to go for your sin? I'm going to hell. I got good news for you. Jesus Christ died for you, so you don't have to go to hell. And it's a free gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. And God says if you'll just believe and ask Jesus to come in your heart and save you. And I've seen the light come on, and I've seen the joy come in their face as if say oh i see it i know now all i got to do is receive jesus and when that happens it's the most wonderful thing in all the world and that happens because we share the gospel share the gospel well i want to i want to see some people saved preacher i've never seen anybody saved in my life join the crowd i've been there but thank god god put a desire in my heart to change that and thank God, then when God put that desire in my heart, I didn't just sit back and say, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. I had to go. I remember the first time I led somebody to Christ after that young man got saved. First time I actually took somebody to Bible and they prayed. Man, I was nervous. Anybody in here nervous when you go soul win? Anybody here scared when you go soul win? I'm the biggest fraidy cat in the world. I'm an introvert. Every guy who's behind the door is nine feet, eight inches tall with an eyeball here. And blah. <coughs> yeah, you're going to kill me. I knocked on this door, and the guy came. I said, I'm, 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 I'm out from Sisica. I couldn't talk. I couldn't. My tongue was wrapped around my eye teeth. I couldn't say a, see a word I was saying. Amen. I was crazy. I was stammering and stuttering. I had it all written down in my Bible, but I couldn't hardly turn the pages. My fingers were so nervous. I'd read the verse, and I couldn't hardly, hardly remember what the verse said. And I'd stumbled through it, and I got through the whole plan of salvation, got to the place where he asked Christ to save you. And I thought to myself, this is crazy. This guy didn't understand a thing I said. I said to him, you wouldn't want to pray and ask Christ to save you right now that's not the way you're supposed to do it amen but that's why i did it because i made a mess of it and you know what he said brother stan he said i sure would i was so shocked i didn't even know what to do i sat there for about three or four seconds oh, oh, oh. i said well let's let's bow our heads and you pray and I walked away and said, God in heaven, I don't know how in the world that happened, but thank you for that, amen. It happened because I shared the gospel. You say, well, I'm really a scaredy cat. God uses tracks, do you? Did I tell you C. Sumner Wimps track story? I think I told it here. I don't want to tell it again if I have. He'd hold it over top of his car. And the track would fall at the feet of a hitchhiker. He did that one day to a sailor. Several months later, he was at a pastor's fellowship, and this young man got up, gave his testimony, said he's walking down the road, Pensacola, Florida guy, pulled over like he's going to pick him up, and said he threw a gospel track out at him. 
He picked it up and cussed him, stuck it in his uniform. When he got to the barracks, he cleaned out his uniform. It said, are you sure you're going to heaven when you die? He sat down, read it, read it trusted Christ as Savior. It said, go to a Baptist church. He went to a Baptist church, told the preacher what happened. Preacher God said, you got to be baptized. You need to get in church. And God called him to be a missionary. And he was there raising support. And Sumner Wimp went up to him and went, went, went said, what day was it? And what road were you on? And about where you were you? And he said, I'm the one that threw the track to you. Hey, you want to see some souls saved? Grab some tracks. Stick them in the bathrooms. Dr. Carl Hatch, Dr. Curtis Hudson was in the airport one time using the restroom, and he heard this guy in the men's restroom going, here, read this while you're doing your job. Here, read this while you're doing your job. Here, read this while you're doing your job. Came to Curtis Hudson and got ready and said, and Curtis said, Carl Hatch, is that you? He said, Curtis, is that you? He said, yep, all right, you don't need one. And he went next one, here, read that while you're doing your job. Share the gospel. Share it. Tell it to whoever you can. That's how you bring forth fruit. One of these days you keep sharing the gospel and somebody's going to accept Christ as Savior and you're going to run down the aisle and say, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I have got children in heaven. Amen. Well, I want to say not only every person that you lead to Christ is fruit, but go to John chapter 4 with me. I like this. Every person you lead to Christ is fruit, the child you have. But there's something more important here that's just as exciting. Look at John chapter 4, verse 35. Jesus said, Say not ye, there are yet four months, then cometh harvest. Behold, I send you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they're white already to harvest. Folks, there's people out there that want to be saved. And he that reapeth, look at that, he that reapeth, receiveth wages, and gathereth what? Fruit unto life eternal. Now watch the next statement. That both he that what? Soweth and he that reapeth what? May rejoice together. And herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. Guess what happens? Not only do you have children when you lead them to Christ, but you have children when you've done the planting. Amen? So you go and you talk to somebody and nothing happens. You go to the door and they won't talk to you. Leave a track. Sometime later, somebody else comes by, talks to them, and they're still not open. Next time, somebody else comes to the door, and they open the door, and they say, yes, I'd like to know that. That person leaves them Christ. You know what God says? You both gathered fruit. <laughs> both of you get to rejoice together. Both of you get the reward. Amen. Can I tell you this? If you will go out and share the gospel, even if you don't lead them to Christ, when they get led to Christ, God says, that's your child too. Amen. Amen, son. Just go out and plant that seed, plant that seed, plant that seed, plant that seed. Well, you know, I don't know if it does any good. No, I don't know if it does any good. But one day somebody comes along, leads him to Christ, and God says, you get to rejoice with him too. That's how you be fruitful. Share the gospel. Share the gospel. Well, lastly, and we'll get done. I can tell it's time to go. Go to Romans chapter 10. Well, I should have read 1 Corinthians 3 to you. Let me just read it while you're going to Romans 10. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It says, for we are labors together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. That means a cultivable cultivable, cultivable crop. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase, and we are labors together with God. Hallelujah. I don't know if you're getting it tonight. Every person you witness to that someone else eventually leads to Christ is your fruit. Well, I didn't lead anybody to Christ, but you talked to somebody and they got saved, so you got some children in heaven. Isn't that exciting? (laughs) Man, I get to heaven, I don't want to be childless. I get to heaven, I don't want to be able to walk up to Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I never brought anybody to you. I never bore any children for you. Well, go to Romans 10. You're there, say amen. I had you turn there earlier. Number one, stay abiding in Christ. Number two, share the gospel. How to be a fruitful Christian. Number three, send the gospel of Christ. Send the gospel of Christ. 
Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him that not believed? How shall they believe in him that not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Now, we had missionaries. Amen. Remember when we had missionaries? Amen. We had to make a decision to cut missionaries. But can I tell you, we need to get back to missions as soon as we can. I mean, today if possible. I mean, this next Sunday if possible. I don't mean 10 years down the road, 5 years down the road. We need to be involved in missions. Why? Because it's fruit producing. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. Verse nine. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Look at verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were all so careful, but you lacked opportunity. What had happened? The church at Philippi had sent Paul a missions offering. If you study this, the only church that supported the missionary Paul was the church of Philippi. They only gave him three love offerings. Pretty sad. Here's the greatest mission ever lived. How many people did he lead to Christ? And only one church ever invested in him. And you know what they missed out on? <laughs> Look down if you would. In verse number 17, not because I desire a gift, but I desire what? Fruit. Let me abound to your account. Paul said, I don't want your money just because I need money and just because I want a gift from you. He says, here's what I want. I want you to invest so you can have some fruit when you get to heaven. Can I tell you this? If I had never led anybody to Christ, I would for dead sure be involved in missions giving. Amen. Because if I want to have fruit in heaven, there's got to be people saved. Amen. By the way, you support this pastor so he can win souls. Amen. Amen. You put your money in the offering plate so this church can keep going so preacher has the time to go out and knock on doors and every person he leads to Christ can get a part of that because you gave to the work. Isn't that exciting? You know what? I mean, that's why I like, I like supporting those guys in the Philippines. There's about 1,000 people a day trusting Christ in the Philippines. <laughs> Just give me some money over to the Philippines. Amen. Just find me one of them guys that's in some region where they're hard. You say, why? That's just unbelievable. Can't happen. Well, in the United States, in the great, uh, great, great American revival, 50,000 people a week got saved. In this country, 1850s. God can save a lot of souls. He's just got to find some fertile soil. The soil in America has become pretty hard. But those places have been in darkness, and now the light's shining. They're wide open. Mexico, South Korea, Philippines, Africa. Souls are getting led to Christ by the thousands every day. And you know what? If you send money to that missionary so he can stay over there and keep preaching the gospel, every person he leads to the Lord is just another fruit in heaven for you. That excites me, man. <laughs> I like that. You know, I can be a fruit bearer and not ever go tell anybody. Not that I shouldn't. It's wrong for me not. But I tell you what, I can have fruit in heaven by using the offering plate for the missionary. Amen. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and I'll be done. I think. I love closing, so ladies, just keep your shoes off for a little bit. Amen? You know, ladies take their shoes off in church. Why do they do that? Ladies' feet hurt all the time, don't they? You know what that is? That's those pointed, to toys and high, pointed toe shoes and high heels you wear all the time. Amen? Get your pair of sneakers on, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> of course, you might not look too good, but amen. That's vanity, isn't it? But go ahead and keep being vain, women. We like it. Amen? <laughs> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, look what it says. For what is our hope, our joy? Watch the next statement, our crown of rejoicing. Are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are glory and our joy. See that crown of rejoicing there? You know what Paul said the crown of rejoicing is? It's the people he'd led to Christ that are in the presence of Christ at his coming. Here's what's going to happen, I believe. Okay, if this doesn't happen, this is Ted Houston's interpretation. And I say that right up front, but I believe it's what's going to happen. You see, I believe that God is going to let us rejoice over the people that got saved because of us. 
I think the other crowns we cast at Jesus' feet, but the crown of rejoicing is one. It's not a crown in itself. It is something we get to do for all eternity. Here's what I believe is going to happen. One day up there in heaven, or maybe as soon as I get to heaven, maybe as soon as I'll get to heaven, somehow God's going to reveal to us how many people are saved because of us. <laughs> I'm not talking about the ones, just the ones we led to Christ. I'm talking about the ones that we maybe we talked to them and then they later got saved. I don't know about the ones we talked to, they later got saved, the ones we led to Christ. I'm not even just talking about that. I'm talking about the ones that we led to Christ who then went and led other people to Christ. I'm talking about right now, I have a young man studying to, to, to be in the ministry, and that young man, every person he leads to Christ, you know what? That's a reward for me. The Bible says, look to yourself that they, not, that they receive a full reward. Anybody who's invested in you is looking for a reward from you. You know what I'm doing? I'm preaching tonight for Brother Jim Lambert. I'm winning souls for Jim Lambert because every soul I lead to Christ is another fruit Jim Lambert gets. It's like we get to heaven, those guys in, uh, in, uh, in Burma, they say to Adoniram Junction, well, Judson, how many people you have saved in, in Burma? Well, I went eight years before I had my first convert. Well, I had thousand souls saved. And God from the, from the throne room says, Judson Taylor, uh, Adoniram Judson had all of them. He went over and plowed the soil and planted the seed. Amen. Here's what's going to happen. I believe this. Just, I don't know if to do this way, but it's, it just sounds good to me, so I'm going to preach it, and you can call me a heretic if you want to. Understand, I prefaced it by saying I don't know what's going to happen this way. Hear a whistle in heaven. <laughs> Have your attention, please. Everybody who's in heaven as a result of Ted Houston come to the pearly gate. Jesus is going to take me over there and say, I want you to see something. I want you to see something, my child. I want you to see who's in heaven because of you. I want you to see your fruit. And all those years I supported Brian Stensis in Uganda, Africa, and all those precious African souls that got saved, they'll all be lined up there. And I just imagine that we got all the time in the world in heaven, amen. One thousand years is as a day, so we won't be worried about time. And I'll just walk by and, and hug their neck and they'll hug mine. And they'll say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And those people I led to Christ that I'll know, amen, we'll just have a joyful hallelujah time in heaven. And that's my crown of rejoicing. And guess what happens? Every time I pass them in heaven, I get to rejoice again. And I say, thank the Lord. I knocked on that door over there on Lafayette Street, across from that prison, and led that guy to the Lord. Thank the Lord. Marvin Bell Smith walked in that guy in our church, walked down the aisle, trusted Christ as Savior, went out and got his liquor bottle, put it to his lips, threw it in the trash can, said, I don't want that anymore. Thank God. And now run around heaven for a little while, having a hallelujah, glory to God, dance and fit. And I say, woo, 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 I have children. I am the vine, you are the branches. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, my father's a husband, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. How do I do that, Brother Houston? Stay abiding in Christ, share the gospel, and send the gospel. Can I tell you, our pastor's got a burden for missions. No reason why we can't be sending them. I just don't have any mother money, Brother Houston. And I'm not preaching on money tonight, but I just thought I'll go, I'll go there. If your bills are paid and you have extra money to go out to eat, then you have money for missions. Your bills are paid and you got money to go to Starbucks and buy coffee, you have money for missions. I think you can do both. I think you can go to Starbucks and give to missions. I think you can go out to eat and give to missions. How do you know that? Because I've done it. How do you know that? Because God's promise. Give and it shall be given to you. Press down, shake it together, running over. God says, well, if you give, I'll give you back more than what you gave me. 
So I might get two Starbucks coffees instead of just one. Amen. And guess what? More than that, I become a fruitful children, and I'm able to come to my Savior and say, Husband, please don't take this in a wrong way, okay? Husband, here's your children. And I think my Savior weeps and rejoices and says, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I remember when my wife went through the valley of death to bring our first son into the world. And all I could do is say to her, thank you. Thank you for doing that for me. I walked out in the hallway and I said, God, if she never wants to give birth again, I'll understand. I was so grateful. Three precious children. All because my wife said, I'm willing to be a fruitful wife. Our Father in heaven, we sure love you tonight. Lord, I love this church. I love these people. I am so excited about the pastor you've given us. I'm so excited about the direction our church is headed. I'm so excited about what happens as we become more fruitful Christians, as we win folks to Christ, as we share the gospel, as we send out missionaries, as we turn this church into a birthing place, a soul-saving place place where people come to know Christ as Savior as we each personally get the joy and privilege to win people to Christ and invest in missions. I know it's the heartbeat of our church. I know it's what the people want. I know I'm preaching to the choir tonight. God, please don't let us ever, 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 ever lose the number one focus, and that's being fruitful. That's preaching the gospel. That's being responsible for people coming to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Now we ask that you'll bless us as we go to our places. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you for being here tonight. I appreciate it.